Yellowstone National Park and this is the Norris Geyser Basin and among the many things that Yellowstone's known for uh, it's known especially for its hydrothermal features the geysers the hot springs uh, that come from this volcanic region and so we're going to spend this video focusing on some of these hydrothermal features talking a little bit about how they form and explaining um, the processes that goes into those a little bit. We've got behind me here um, a pool here, hot spring, and then a small geyser just behind it that's spitting out a little bit of water. Not as big as Old Faithful or some of the other ones you might know. I'll try to include uh, any other more impressive geyser footage on this if I happen to encounter any. This is veteran geyser, so this is a fairly small geyser. But one thing we can see here is just how barren the landscape is. The, the trees aren't growing well, um, and these hydrothermal features are kind of out on their own. And there's really a couple of ways that these hydrothermal features uh, form. <clears throat> Obviously, you need a heat source. And in Yellowstone, we have, of course, a, a volcano, a, a volcanic system there. You don't necessarily need magma, though. I think one of the big misunderstandings is that underneath all this is some vast magma chamber. There's been some recent research that suggests that the magma chamber beneath Yellowstone is maybe somewhere around 70% crystallized so that part of the um, the magma that sits below it has actually formed solidified crystals. But you definitely need some sort of heat source um, beneath the area. The other thing you need is a lot of water and so the Yellowstone Plateau region receives quite a bit of rain and snowfall being at high elevation and so this area gets plenty of water in the snow and in other parts of the year. Then we have the rocks themselves. Now this geyser basin is mainly um, situated in the Lava Creek Tuff, so a ash deposit that erupted during the last Yellowstone eruption about 630,000 years ago. That's what forms most of the rock here. If you look though, it doesn't look like there's a lot of that rock showing because we have these hydrothermal features here uh, that are bringing up gases that are rich in um, sulfur, among other things, and creating sulfuric acid and acidic conditions that dissolve away a lot of that rock. So the Lava Creek Tuff is a low permeability unit. So what that means is that when the rain falls um, on this region before this, this basin had developed uh, with these hydrothermal features, the water isn't able to percolate down very easily. So a lot of it stays close to the surface. Um, <clears throat> by keeping that water close to the surface, you can of course create different sorts of hot springs, geysers, and hydrothermal features such as we see here. Um, and so we have low permeability, we have high rainfall amounts, a lot of water falling through the atmosphere, uh, low permeability rocks, and then a heat source beneath it that can heat up the groundwater uh, through fractures and faults and other sort of conduits and plumbing systems and allow that hot water to make its way to the surface quicker than it might otherwise and um, and then create this great hydrothermal area in here. So let's look at a, a simple diagram I put together that um, explains geysers. And maybe the, the best thing to do first is, is differentiate uh, a couple of terms here that we see. So we have geysers, we of course have hot springs, and then a third type of hydrothermal feature that you may or may not know are what are known as uh, fumaroles. And so geysers are the the eruptions of hot water. So it's actually being thrown up into the air. It's under pressure. And so that's throwing out hot water and steam. A hot spring like we have here is just hot water that's much more calm. It's not being ejected into the air. So hot water that's more passively rising to the surface. Uh, and then over here, right through these fractures here, we can see uh, a fumarole, just basically a vent where only steam is escaping. Undoubtedly, there's hot water somewhere down below the surface, but the only thing coming out at the surface is the steam. So fumaroles, hot springs, and geysers. And here in this one little spot, we get one of each. Uh, and so let's look at how geysers form. And so the idea here, a little person for scale, is that we have some sort of plumbing system beneath uh, the geyser and so you know we've got cracks and cavities and uh, holes in the rock and this is just very cartoonish here but the idea is that the heat down here the hot rocks 
are heating up the water. Uh, the water uh, is being heated up but because there's so much water sitting on top of it, this water can't flash to steam. So normally at sea level, we would get uh, water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Up here at Yellowstone at high elevation, it'd be a little bit lower than that because there's less atmospheric pressure. But the idea is, is that this, this hot water uh, can't turn, can't boil. It can't turn into steam because it's got the weight of the rest of the water in the in the conduit in the plumbing system sitting on top of it so the water just gets heated more and more and more eventually you reach some so it's super heated water and eventually you reach some super critical temperature it varies by by geyser where you do actually get um it heats up so much that it's able able to overcome the pressure the water flashes into steam so here's our little bubbles uh and then once that happens, the expansion of the water from liquid to gas is able to push the water or drive it out of the, the vent here, and then you get an eruption of water. Uh, for most geysers too, in order to get a good spray of water pushing up into the air, you need some sort of constriction, so some sort of narrow opening in the conduit system, and that will allow the geyser to erupt. And then the geyser will erupt whatever amount of water is above uh, the gases that, are, that have formed here. It'll empty out all the water in these chambers, and that will be the geyser eruption. And then slowly but surely, water will seep back in through the ground, through the rocks and the pore spaces into these cavities uh, and then start getting heated up again by the by whatever heats in the subsurface and then the process starts all over again and so uh, hopefully that helps a little bit give you a little bit of background on on how these geysers erupt um, and so this is the Norris geyser basin we have several in <clears throat> the Yellowstone area there's one near Old Faithful uh, there's there's a one near West Thumb by the lake this one is just outside of the caldera, so the main caldera that formed about 630,000 years ago. It sits just outside it, uh, but it's probably fed by several uh, fractures and faults that were probably related to that caldera forming. So um, we'll maybe add on to this video a little bit more if I find some good uh, eruption sites in this area of uh, some geysers erupting, but hopefully that was helpful, giving you a little bit of knowledge and insights into how these types of hydrothe or hydrothermal features form. Oh, one last thing I could include here is <clears throat> we can see some of the rock lining these. This is actually a rock called sinter. So as the acidic uh, groundwater dissolves out the, the tuff, the rock that was the, here before, the ash-rich rock, um, as these geysers erupt, a lot of them form mounds or there's mineral coatings around the base of them. Try to get away from the, the steam there. Uh, this, as they erupt and the water falls back down, it precipitates a mineral deposit uh, called sinter. And this stuff is um, uh, very impermeable. And so we, we, it forms a pretty hard resistant rock. You can see it kind of forming in layers over here by this fumarole, just sort of forming concentric little layers. Um, yeah, and then we have, you know, the reason we don't have a lot of vegetation out here is the, uh, the, the heat of the ground and the acidic conditions are pretty uh, rough for the plants and vegetative communities to grow. Um, I've got my little handy uh, thermometer here. We can maybe get a quick reading on this geyser. I think, oh, that was pretty good there. Uh, during that pulse there, went up to about 140. Uh, and I'm standing, you know, maybe 15 feet away, so it's likely a little bit hotter than that. Um, but very hot water coming out of these vents here. So we'll wrap up with this one. I might tag on uh, a cool little short video uh, showing a geyser erupting if we have a little bit more impressive one to look at later. But hopefully you enjoyed this uh, little lesson on Yellowstone's hydrothermal features, how geysers erupt, and some of the fun facts we've talked about here. Thanks. This is Steamboat Geyser, uh, not erupting currently, but notable because this is one of the largest geysers, uh, not just in Yellowstone, but I believe the world. When this geyser 
has a large eruption, it can push water up to about 300 feet in height. Um, and it's a very erratic geyser. Um, it goes years at a time without erupting, um, and then it can erupt several times within a year. So it's got a very complicated and complex uh, plumbing system and behavior of eruptions. But what's notable here is um, just sort of the devastation that the past eruptions have caused to this area. So we can see all these trees around it that are completely just stripped bare uh, and pretty much dead. Um, <clears throat> when this thing blasts these acidic waters and it falls down on the trees, um, that's pretty much game over for these trees. We can also see a lot of big blocks littering the ground. Um, possibly, I'd have to check this, but possibly due to uh, some of the big er eruptions here that might have also broken up some of the cone, the mineralized cone around the vent and thrown some blocks around the vent area here. So Steamboat Geyser, uh, definitely one of the more uh, famous and notable geysers in the Yellowstone area.